Hello. Um, Salvone, we would say at home. In which case you would say, yeah, boy. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> um, I know that Achala Raja and myself, who are the two order members in Johannesburg, have both been dire, as in we haven't at all written into Shabda. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, most of you don't know much about the situation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit at the beginning about the situation and then uh, perhaps a little bit about what it's like to be there and um, what's going on for me in the practice of being there. Um, so our Sangha is called Shantikula, which we'd like to say is Peaceful Tribe. Um, and we have a house that's been converted into a very, very beautiful centre. Um, in uh, a place called Emerentia, which is in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. And one of the fantastic characteristics of Achala Raja is that he makes everything beautiful. So um, we live in a garden with, uh, I think it's 140 varieties of aloe, um, and running water, and a cedarwood tea house. Uh, it's a very, very beautiful place. And at the moment, living there is Achala Raja, and myself, and my partner Rebecca, who's not a Buddhist, and a young man called Mbunisi from Zimbabwe, who sometimes works there, who's also not a Buddhist. And um, we have four dogs, th two of which are only three, have only have three legs. Um, we have many of the 40 cats from next door visiting us, and the dogs attempting to chase and kill them. Um, we have 17 guinea pigs, Although I suspect that number is growing rapidly. Um, we have one boa constrictor who is slightly terrifying and I do not feel confident to handle him. Um, and uh, many, many, many lizards and geckos. Um, Achilaraja co co collects all sorts of scaly reptilian objects. <laughs> so it is a lively place. And um, perhaps it doesn't look so much like a conventional Tri Ratna <laughs> community or centre. Um, but I do think that that's one of the characteristics, actually, of being in a situation that's quite far from the centre, if you like. Um, we sort of, we're sort of making do with um, who and what we are um, and what resources we have available to us, and we're kind of making it up as we go along. Um, and I think that's actually an important characteristic of being in a kind of pioneering situation. You kind of just have to make it work. Um, I'm very lucky to be in a, a virtual chapter. Um, Utpalavadri is here. She's my only chapter member who I met yesterday for the first time in real flesh and blood, which is really lovely. Um, and Achilaraj is not in a chapter at the moment, so in the, um, in the vein of making do with what we got, we have a paragraph. So every Sunday night we have a paragraph meeting because it's not quite enough to make up a chapter. Um, <laughs> um, we now have six mitras, and um, two of them are rather unwell, so I'll put their names up on the, on the uh, Karuna board. Um, and one lives in Cape Town. Um, but it's a really lovely little community, actually. Um, and, and there are very, very committed practitioners who've managed to really keep their own initiative in their practice, despite very variable levels of input and um, support. Um, and, I mean, the Johannesburg situation has been around for probably 12 years now, but for a variety of reasons, including Vajdara's health and uh, Ratnajoti moving back to Johannesburg, um, there, there really hasn't yet been a long time consistent period where we've had the resources to build up a situation. So it's not a new situation, but it feels like it's a situation in a, um, possi with a possibility of rebirth, if you like, of actually creating enough foundation and stability and consistently to grow the situation. So it feels quite new in that way and it's growing reasonably fast. Um, I, I actually joined in April this year. Um, and uh, it's gone from sort of two or three people on a Sangha night, and we, we had 18 at the last one. Um, and we've started a series of talks um, that oh, there's, such, there's such a thirst actually for the Dharma. So it feels like anything that you can do gets, um, gets sucked, 
sucked up beautifully, like a good vacuum. Um, and I'll say one more thing about resources before I speak a bit more personally. Um, uh, Vajradhara, when he passed away, left all his sort of life insurance money um, to Achalaraja, who's basically paid for the whole centre. Um, so we're in one of the few situations, really, of a small situation that isn't scrambling for money the whole time. Um, and Achalaraja has a pension, also from Vajradhara. So he's able to be there making things beautiful and um, feeding the many animals. Um, and I work full time, but my support from the center is to be able to come here once a year, either on a retreat or a convention. So I'd like to um, acknowledge Achalaraja's generosity in doing that. So, um, so in some ways we've got, we've got some of the resources that are often the most difficult to find um, ready, ready to go. Okay. Um, everything that I say now, I know is too soon to speak about. Um, I, I moved up in April. We really started a, a bit of a new program in beginning of May, so that's a few months. Um, so I'm just I'm just getting used to this. I'm beginning to understand a little bit of the landscape of what I've gotten myself into: hot water, mountains. Um, so yeah, it's it's very much my first impressions, and I hope they look different in a year's time. Um, I've, I've been asked the question of kind of what, how these conditions or how being in the situation <coughs> affects my practice. Um, and there are really three main ways, I think. The first, which is obvious perhaps, um, is that teaching the Dharma keeps the Dharma in mind. Um, it seems obvious, but it has quite a profound effect, and particularly for someone like myself who's generally hopelessly overcommitted. Um, and who's never done any Mitra study. Um, having to do a talk, a Dharma talk, every two weeks means that I actually have to make the time and the space to go and listen to FBA and um, read Sangharachita's papers and really try and think, like, what does this mean? What does it mean for me? What are the questions? How to formulate it? Um, and to be able to see how other people uh, engage with um, Dharma teachings for the first time, which is of course fantastic. It's like little little bursts of flowers everywhere. Um, so that's the first thing, to be in a situation where even if you are hopelessly uh, underprepared, um, you're doing Dharma teaching means that you have to stay very close to the Dharma. Um, and I think that's particularly important because I have less time on the cushion, perhaps, than I've ever had. Um, the second thing is that um, my actions have an effect, um, which is obviously a very good basic dharma. Um, but often in, a situa in many other situations it feels like the, the feedback loop is quite dispersed or um, not necessarily visible to me or I don't want to look or something like that. Um, but in a situation like that, it's very, very clear to me that my mental states in the moment uh, in engaging with my practice or engaging in teaching or entering into relationships with people who are coming to the center are profoundly affected by uh, my own mental states, um, which means that I actually have to watch them. I have to look after my own mental states much more than I would in a situation where it sort of feels less um, precious those interactions. And of course, you know, all those interactions of all sorts should be precious, but it does feel like there's a, there's a particular intensity to that. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, this is important in my relationship with Achala Raja. And I have this very strong sense, I don't know who it was at Tirat Naloka, who whenever they said Hri and Apatrapia, would go like this. You know, anyone from Tirat Naloka remember who does it? Anyway, simply I remember that I can't I can't think about Kriya and Apatrapia without without this sort of like but it, it feels like there's a real kind of protection in um, in thinking about or holding my actions and my thoughts um, in relation to the wise um, and to ask what other people who I respect greatly um, would think about 
or how they would respond to what I do, and to have self-respect, to try and appear um, in my own experience as uh, upright as possible. When my natural inclination is to be running around, <laughs> not so upright. Um, I think the most, I don't know, um, the most challenging uh, is, or, the, or the, the ones that are accompanied by negative Vedana more often, um, is, are all of the situations, or all the things that the situations call upon me um, that must lead in a reduction in self-clinging. Like the situations call, call into being uh, the need for certain kinds of qualities, and they're not necessarily my qualities. Um, so that's been a real lesson. Uh, the first one, I think, is about virya for, for me. Uh, many of the people who come to the center in Johannesburg lead lives of incredibly intense activity. Johannesburg is a frontier town. Uh, it's pretty naked, it's pretty brutal, it's extremely competitive, it's exceptionally materialistic, it's fast. Lots is going on. So people who come to the center often are quite exhausted or like bordering towards the, the sort of manic side of things. Or they've crashed. Yeah? Um, and are sort of leopard crawling their way over the front doorstep. Or are actually managing but are holding an enormous amount. Um, and so I've, I've been trying to really work. I have a lot of energy which is an advantage. But not all energy is good energy. Um, so I've really been trying to work, what it's called upon me to do is to sort of manage my own energy levels, to look after myself, and to make sure that I don't sort of um, meet people who are coming in with a lot of sort of extreme, extreme situations and states with the same kind of states. So it's really important for me to be able to um, plumb a line of silence somewhere that allows energy to be virya as opposed to something else. So that's one of the areas that I feel I have been called to work on uh, in this. And the second, and I think it's related, is a question of peace. Um, South Africa is um, a difficult place. And as many of you know, it's, or as all of you know, it has a, a deep history of trauma, of racism, of violence, um, and of absolutely remarkable responses to it. Um, but it's not, it's not a place of great superficiality. It's a place where people uh, bring a lot of stuff into their encounters. Um, I was really struck again when we did um, the puja the other night of the words at the beginning, I think it's the first phase of the Dhammapada puja, and the Buddha is, his thoughts are peace, his words are peace, his actions are peace. Um, and it feels to me like it's a very, very important thing to do to, to be peace to be able to create a center that is both a refuge, but also can be the source of something that, that spreads peace, not, not just is a place of refuge, but that can, can be peace in the world. And I don't know what that means yet. I don't know what it means um, in my experience, and I don't really know what it means for the future of the center. Um, but I sort of have a sense that, uh, that this will be a question that I will live for the rest of my life. Um, what does it mean to have the Dharma in South Africa? What would the Dharma look like in South Africa? What does it do? Um, what kind of effect can it have? So that's, that's, that's a big job. And then um, the third is about remembering inspiration, and remembering connection, remembering friendship. There were times when I was going through um, the ordination process where I would come to Tiratnaloka for retreats and I would feel uh, just bathed in the Sangha and uh, uh, showered by the Dharma. Um, and then I'd, I'd hop on the plane and I would just feel absolutely bereft, thinking that 
somehow I was leaving this place of um, inspiration. Um, but actually, actually that's not true. Uh, like all communities are virtual. Um, and I have been incredibly lucky. I've been lucky, but also um, I, think that, I think that one of the things that happens if you're far away is that people really care. Uh, I've had an extraordinary generosity from women at Tirat and Loka, from my chapter, from friends, from people who I went through the ordination process with. It's actually an incredibly rich community and a rich source of inspiration to uh, remember that actually I'm doing what I most love. Um, and so the, the thing about staying fresh and staying juicy and staying curious and staying connected with the people who um, I find inspiring uh, is really important in a situation that's a little further away. Or a little. <laughs> um, I wanted to say two more things. I don't know how much time I've got. Am I okay? Okay. Two more things. The one is, there are many advantages to being in a far-flung situation. You may not think so, but let me name them in order to inspire you to go to far-flung situations. Uh, the first is that people will really go out of their way to help you. Uh, there's an enormous amount of interest and kind of um, yeah, desire to spread the Dharma. Even if, even if they're not doing, others are not doing it themselves, they really do want to support you. Uh, and it's possible to, to ride on some of those waves. The second is that it will, uh, it will ask of you resilience and confidence, which are really, really important in all things, including in your Dharma practice. And those two things can work together. You really have to, you really have to take confidence in the Dharma and get out of the way of the Dharma in some ways in order to be able to let it through. The third uh, is for those of you who don't like strictures of authority terribly much, um, and don't like kind of doing things the way everybody always does them. Um, the advantages of being in a small and far-flung situation is that you have to make it up. You just have, you have to make it work. You have to do whatever you can with whatever is at hand. And actually there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of energy in it. I was very aware of this in going through the ordination process. I didn't have to worry about coolers. It's none of that politics. Um, I didn't have to worry about like whether somebody else was ordained before or after me. Like just none of that stuff was there because it was just me. It was just my process. Um, and in the end, uh, when it came to my ordination, Ratnadharani just asked a whole bunch of friends to write about our friendship because that was Buddhist and not Buddhist. So there really is something about actually there's there's quite a lot of space. And if you have the initiative and you want to do something, then you can make things happen and you can make a lot happen, actually. Um, the last thing I want to say is, what can you do to help? <laughs> um, the first thing is, if you're anywhere near South Africa, please come and visit. And I know that there are ex-South Africans or people who've got family in South Africa or people who go to Cape Town on holiday, which is a really good thing to do. It's very, very beautiful. Just, just swing by, even if it's just to say hello, um, or even better still, just to uh, yeah, engage with the Sangha at some level. Please do. The second thing I'd like to say is, or ask, is that you keep an eye on us. Um, there's very little sort of natural accountability structures in a far-flung situation. And it's a fairly ludicrous situation that I have been ordained for a year, and actually I've just been ordained for three or four years, and we're running a center, you know? Um, so I'd really ask that people do keep an eye on us and, and keep in communication, and ask how things are going, and ask us to reflect on, on that. Um, it's an important safety net for us and also for the people who come to the centre. Um, and intervene if you think we're in trouble. Yeah, I'd really, I'd really ask that. Um, yeah, and just, I, yeah, keep, keep being great. Keep being, being lovely to be a part of and to feel like this is, this is a meaningful life. It's really the only meaningful life I can think of. Um, and yeah, thank you.